Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all. Thank you all very much for interrupting your August vacation to come to this press conference. Um, so I'm going to speak for four or five minutes, uh, and in Bruno Lanvin, as Samar has already indicated, we'll take you through much more detail of this. But let me make some uh, preliminary remarks, if I may. Why do we do this? Well, look, uh, uh, to express uh, uh, to some extent a personal view, but I do believe it's an organizational view and the view of the uh, co-authors of the Global Innovation Index, innovation is a very fundamental phenomenon which is responsible for a large number of social and economic benefits. We're very focused on the economic side, but let's not forget the constant process uh, of improvement that humanity has undergone as a consequence largely of doing things in a different way, in a new way, and, and, and as a consequence really of innovation. Um, in the current environment, uh, innovation assumes particular significance because of its potential to uh, open uh, up new avenues of economic growth. So since the global financial crisis, we're all aware that the world economy has underperformed. Uh, and in the search for ways in which that performance can be improved, one rather obvious element uh, that requires, uh, I think, high-level policy attention is innovation because the causal connection between innovation and economic growth has now been a matter of rather standard economic uh, theory for decades. Uh, so we see that it is particularly important uh, to renew the emphasis on innovation in the current environment. What does the Global Innovation Index do and what's its contribution here, because in innovation is a very complex phenomenon, of course. Well, its contribution is to provide a ranking and a benchmarking via some 82, 84 indicators uh, of the innovation capacity and performance of countries around the world. Uh, and uh, we feel that this... this uh, benchmarking of uh, innovation capacity and performance is extremely important for policymakers in assessing uh, their own country's uh, performance in, as I said, this very complex area where a large number of factors have to come together in order to create a successful innovation ecosystem. Uh, so it is the consideration, overall consideration, of all of these factors which uh, is, I think, uh, what uh, makes the innovation ecosystem in the end. Uh, we do have each year a particular theme that the analytical studies associated with the index, index focus on. This year it's winning through innovation or international collaboration uh, in respect of innovation. And that is particularly important, uh, of course, uh, because there are significant benefits that do flow from international co uh, collaboration in innovation. Very often it is considered that this is a zero-sum uh, competitive game, uh, innovation, but the analytical studies that accompany the index this year indicate uh, that <clears throat> there are benefits for everyone, and it's very much a win-win situation, with international collaboration uh, in innovation. Uh, and that is a phenomenon that is uh, occurring more frequently these days. As to individual performances, well, you're all familiar with the overall ranking that was achieved uh, by various countries, Switzerland again coming out on top, uh, and Bruno will take you through the details of that. Let me point to the performance of China uh, since it, uh, in coming in as, uh, at number 25 in the rankings, is now joining uh, the uh, upper middle uh, income and uh, uh, upper income group of countries who, that have traditionally dominated the top slots in the innovation, uh, the Global Innovation Index. 
Uh, and that, of course, is in keeping with all of the things that we, all of the developments that we have seen in China in recent years, including the current great, uh, enormous emphasis on innovation as a major component in the transition of the Chinese economy from uh, made in China to created in China. Uh, each year, the uh, methodology used for the Global Innovation Index is improved. We work on that amongst uh, the partners and the editors. Uh, and uh, to some extent, performances from one year to another uh, too much emphasis should not be placed on them. It's longer term trends that are important. Uh, nevertheless, uh, with that qualification in mind, uh, this performance on the part of China is interesting. Uh, also interesting, if I may single out one other large economy, is the performance of uh, India, which has improved some 15 places to number 66 uh, from uh, number 81, I think, uh, last year. So that's another interesting transition. So with that, uh, let me uh, just take the opportunity, if I may, to thank the editors uh, of the Global Innovation Index, Bruno Lanvin, who is uh, present here, Sumitra Dutra, and uh, Sasha von uh, Vincent, my colleague who's seated uh, over here, uh, to thank our partners uh, the, uh, in this uh, exercise, uh, not only INSEAD and the Cornell University Business School, but all of our knowledge partners uh, whose input is highly appreciated. Thank you very much, and I will uh, pass the floor to Bruno. <coughs> Thank you, Francis. Um, just to maximize the time for uh, questions and answers, I also shall try to be very, very brief um, and just uh, stress a few points about this year's edition of the Global Innovation Index, the ninth uh, edition. Um, as uh, the Director General just mentioned, we look at a world where growth is slow and remains uneven, and it is likely to remain slow growth for a number of years. Uh, this is typically a context in which uh, public expenses on research and development and to, large, to a large extent private investment uh, are threatened uh, because of competing claims, because of uh, differences of views. And one of the lessons we learned from previous editions of GII is that innovation is uh, an area in which stop and go policies can be very damaging. Um, if investment slows down from one year to the next, the benefits accrued from previous years uh, might be erased very quickly. So uh, this is a message which is particularly important for a, a continent like Africa, where we had very good signs of innovation picking up last year, and we see a number of countries indeed improving significantly. Um, and because Africa remains a continent of many challenges. Um, it is our hope that these efforts uh, will not be raised in the uh, uh, next few years, and that will depend uh, to a large extent on national government policies. Um, the um, uh, importance that um, uh, Francis Gurry just uh, stressed about innovation as a source for growth. Uh, is critically important at this point in time. Um, to uh, simplify things, one could say that we live in a world where emerging countries need to invent their future and mature economies need to reinvent their models. Uh, innovation in both cases is critically important. Um, the uh, main challenges of mass unemployment, especially for younger people uh, and other uh, types of uh, challenges cannot be faced in the absence of an engine, and uh, innovation is one of the possible engines here. Um, regarding the theme of this year, um, winning with global innovation, um, we have stressed in previous editions that innovation is indeed becoming global in at least two ways. On one hand, cross-border cooperation is increasingly uh, important in generating innovation. Uh, those countries who have had open policies of cooperation have proved more successful at innovation in general. 
A second way of looking at the globalization of innovation is to see that an increasing number of contenders are entering the field of global competition. And uh, signals that the one that uh, uh, the Director General just mentioned of uh, China breaking in the top 25 um, is just a harbinger of more to come. Uh, the significant progress made by India, plus 15, um, is indeed a sign that we are going to see more uh, from emerging countries in the field of innovation in the years to come, and that's part of globalization. Uh, each uh, region has its champions. So you all have in front of you the rankings for this year, uh, Switzerland being there for the sixth year in a row, quite uh, remarkable. Uh, and then we have uh, Sweden, the UK, US, Finland, Singapore. Um, so there's relatively little change in that group. Basically, uh, all the countries we find in the top 10 were already in the top 10 last, last year. Uh, yet, there are uh, switches. And uh, as mentioned before, uh, there are very interesting things happening in the middle of the rankings, especially if we look at uh, emerging and middle income, uh, income countries. Uh, in uh, Africa, for instance, we have uh, Mauritius, South Africa, Kenya, uh, topping the, the rankings. In Latin America uh, and the Caribbean, we have Chile, we have Costa Rica, we have Mexico. Uh, each of those countries uh, have its own lessons, uh, its own indicators of what can be successful in innovating um, in different ways, whether it is in the private sector or the public sector. Um, one of the, the key messages that was already uh, highlighted last year is that quality matters. There are different ways uh, to innovate. Uh, and what we see is that in the uh, sub-indicator we use to define quality of innovation, which includes the quality of uh, uh, top universities, publications, etc., we see countries like China, like uh, uh, Brazil, like India making significant progress. So on that front as well, which is not purely quantitative, uh, we see uh, reasons for hope and um, reduction of a divide that is still very much, uh, very much there. Um, one important message that emerged, and I will stop there for the time being for this year, uh, from this year's report, is that the, um, there is a need um, to reinforce global governance regarding innovation. Um, there has been attempts made by uh, scientific advisors, uh, chief scientists of various governments to work together. Um, we have examples showing that international and intergovernmental cooperations in the area of research works, and, and CERN, who is represented uh, here uh, by Giovanni Anelli, is, is a critical example that we have just at hand here in Geneva. Um, so we have examples where this cooperation works, and the report is a call for more of this. Um, indeed looking at some of the major challenges, whether they have to do with genomics, um, with robotization, uh, with uh, uh, you know, space exploration, with the private sector coming in. There are important innovation components uh, which call for more governance, uh, because if we don't anticipate what the regulatory challenges will be in the future, uh, they may be more difficult to, to solve. Uh, and uh, the chapters, including in this year's uh, report, deal with that uh, in, uh, in more depth. So um, this is what um, uh, I thought might be useful to highlight from this year's report, and uh, we stand ready for your questions. Please. Yes. Yes, please. Please identify yourself. That would be great. Hello, my name is Ben Simon. I work for the AFP News Agency. Um, is there a way you could summarize in lay terms the methodology that we're using here? What makes one country more innovative than the other? What are the key areas you're looking at? Thank you. 
Yes, in very brief terms, this is a composite index, uh, 82 variables this year distributed in, uh, in uh, six pillars. Um, one side is what we call the input, the other side the output, and basically the uh, input describes the efforts made by various countries. This is how much effort, resources, money they're investing in, in education, in infrastructure, in R&D spending. On the output side, we look more at um, what is their success in terms of creative uh, output, in particular in terms of number of patents, uh, li licenses they are issuing, and we put all that together. Um, and this is an unweighted index. That is the choice from a methodological point which is made is how many variables we include to describe a particular aspect of innovation. Um, it is a deliberate choice. Uh, it was not the only choice that was made 10 years ago when the index uh, started, but the, um, it proved very robust. Uh, it has uh, offered um, a sound basis for what we think is the, the main objective of this report, uh, which is not to rank countries, is to provide a policy tool is provide a basis from which you can to improve your innovation performance and guiding you through which steps can be taken to improve it. Um, yes, we, I mean, this kind of topics could trigger millions of questions. I am going now just to stick to one, which unfortunately I can only start with mentioning, quote, quote, uh, quoting the text in French, since I have a French version. Les États-Unis d'Amérique demeurent l'une des nations les plus innovantes. Euh, elles obtiennent, ils obtiennent cependant un moins, de moins bons résultats en ce qui concerne les dépenses d'éducation, l'enseignement supérieur, etc. Uh, we could read this statement in two totally opposite ways. We can say that the U.S. still have a good industrial and high-tech output, but it is doomed for the future because they don't spend enough for education university. Or we could interpret it in challenging that there is any relation between the spending for prestigious universities and the actual dy uh, high, um, technological dynamism. And I don't know if you have a clue to choose between these two interpretations, but, for the f but I think that classical economic theory, which uh, Director General seems to know quite well, has never been able to address this. The, uh, between the two explanations, I would definitely choose the first. Okay? The, uh, coming from an academic institution, uh, and it's, uh, it's a pity that Sumitra Dutta cannot be with us because he's the, he's the dean of uh, a major U.S. university, so he would have an even stronger point of view on that. But uh, let me not speak uh, on behalf of Sumitra, but on my own behalf. Uh, the correlation between education and innovation doesn't need to be proved. It's not just the case of the US. If you look at the top 10 uh, in this ranking, you will see that all these countries have indeed a strong university base. Uh, Switzerland with the uh, Ecole Polytechnique and uh, uh, other institutions uh, and famous universities uh, is clearly in that category. Regarding the degree of causality, that is, is the U.S. doomed because they are not investing enough in education, I would not go as far as stating it that way, but one could say, if that performance is to be kept in the future, indeed looking at what's happening in the university and research system is important, keeping in mind that it's not just the quality of the, the institutions themselves, it's also the ability to attract foreign talents. One of the major strengths of major US universities, and it would go for UK universities and others, is not just the ability to uh, train and create local talent, is the ability to attract foreign brains and create some diversity and mix of these talents. Uh, this is a path that China has been taking uh, already a number of years ago. 
uh, China used to be a country where the brightest people actually went to get the training outside. It has now become a country in which the number of foreign students coming into China is bigger than the number of Chinese students studying abroad. So this ability to attract brains and mix them together is a critical component. It has been part of the success of the US, and if everybody is aware of that, I have no doubt that uh, additional efforts are going to be made to maintain it. If I am not taking the speaking time of anyone else, first, as a reaction to what you said, yes, you're right that the main purpose of ranking country, I mean, uh, uh, ranking should not be the main purpose, and how relevant and robust our indicators should be the real core of the issue. But I am going to ask a question on two countries which might let's say, raise more questions than uh, provide answers. Why is the UK the most messy country in the European Union, outperforming Germany, outperforming uh, France, outperforming countries which, in a way, could be as, I mean, performing and has uh, intellectual and technical traditions which are well worth. Uh, there is here a, a singularity which probably is significant and which would be worth analyzing. Then concerning regions like Asia, we are not too surprised to see Israel and Cyprus outperforming uh, Iraq, Syria or Afghanistan. Does it make much sense even to rank countries in this region, this way, between states which are nearly virtual cities like UAR and countries which have huge, uh, massive, basic problems to fix. Okay, uh, regarding the um, UK singularity, uh, nobody more the French would agree that the UK is very singular. Um, the, indeed, uh, it has been the subject of many uh, research and studies to see what makes the difference, differences between various European countries who very much share a common uh, history, uh, largely a common culture, same traditions in education, etc. What makes the difference? And this is typically the, the type of uh, areas in which uh, GI can try to help. If, for instance, we look at the, um, uh, the UK uh, performance, um, we see that uh, the UK is actually rarely number one in any of the variables. But they have a very steady performance. There's a, a large majority of the indicators where they typically run, rank between one and 10. Mm -hmm. So there is this idea of a very balanced performance, whatever the, the pillar you look at into innovation, which is also a particularity of Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland has a very even uh, performance across all the, the pillars. As opposed to countries like France, for instance, who has some very bright results in, in some areas and some uh, less uh, spectacular results in other areas. So there is less... In, in spite of more centralized planning in France? That, that, that would be debatable. That is the, uh, there's indeed this uh, uh, tradition of centralization uh, especially even when it comes to granting credits, etc., which has been actually uh, diminishing uh, during the last few years. That is, we've seen largely for reasons that we did not, need not get into here today, but the change in the fiscal regimes where uh, the national taxes have been reduced and the local taxes have been increased. Typically, this has led also to less centralization in some of the ways in which innovation has been, has been funded. Uh, but beyond that, uh, it has not necessarily proved to an advantage to have more centralized ways of dealing with, uh, with innovation. Uh, the example of the US, for instance, is is one in which clusters have been maturing more than federal policies. In spite of that, large programs, DARPA, etc., think of the way the internet was created, has undoubtedly helped. But there's no clearly uh, well-made message that would say centralization is better or decentralization is better. It's clearly... It would bring more even results. 
should. It, it should. It should, as as Francis uh, just whispered, it should. Um, uh, now, the, if we look at the way in which Europe as a whole uh, has been looking, has been trying to stimulate innovation. It has been a combination of successes and failures. Uh, successes have included the Eureka program, for instance, by which countries were almost forced to cooperate. This is where we get to the theme of this year's report, saying there is a pot of money here. These are European subsidies. To have a chance to get them, you need to present a project that includes at least three countries from the Union. Okay? That, that was a way to force cooperation, and this has been successful. An area where uh, success has been less, uh, well, let, we, we can think of uh, failure, has been to try and finance clusters through uh, European funding. Because the, um, uh, Europe has been uh, torn between two tendencies. One, which was to say, oh, um, if Slovenia, I'm taking one country at random, Slovenia has one cluster financed by EU funding, uh, my country, which is six or seven times uh, the size of Slovenia, should have six or seven. Okay? And, um, and the other tendency was to say we need to have an even policy and try to make sure that every country in the Union has a chance to foster innovation. And this has proved a dead end. That is, a number of uh, clusters have been financed with very little results, and those who were already successful have become sometimes more successful but with no discriminant uh, effect from, uh, from EU funding. So this issue of centralization versus decentralization is definitely a, a murky one. Uh, regarding the other aspects of your question, very quickly, um, comparing countries of different size uh, is always a challenge in this kind of indices. So some, uh, clearly, Singapore is a city-state. Okay? Uh, how can you compare Singapore to China? We don't compare Singapore and China. We give indicators that happen to be the same ones. But clearly, uh, dimensions comes into play when we try to infer from indicators such as those in GII, what could be the policy recommendations uh, that would matter for innovation. Uh, may I just <clears throat> add uh, one or two words to what Bruno has said? You know, um, it's a very interesting question, if I may say, that you ask, because, of course, the popular view of, uh, the, let's say, the last 50 years was, was that the United Kingdom was quite good at basic research. Uh, but not so good at applied, the application of it. And here is a result which indicates uh, that that uh, popular view is, is no longer perhaps correct. Uh, I would say one other, uh, in addition to the considerations mentioned by Bruno, one other thing to consider is the high level political attention paid to innovation as a policy. Now, I think it's true of all European countries that you get that to a certain extent, but it's very explicit in the case of the United Kingdom. So they do have a minister, for example, they're the only country which has, in Europe, which has a minister for intellectual property. Uh, that was a deliberate policy choice. They have taken a, a, a range of, of initiatives such as emulating the German Fraunhofer uh, experience by putting in place the catapult network. Uh, so they've been very actively engaged, I think, in, in trying to promote uh, innovation. Of course, they have very high-performing uh, universities or certain high-performing universities. Uh, and uh, a factor that Bruno mentioned earlier of attracting foreigners to the university is particularly high. I read a survey that was published last week where it was uh, 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 giving the analysis that about 20% of foreign students in the world are going towards the United States of America and about 10% to the United Kingdom as the second uh, ranking. So uh, there is an attraction and of course language can be an advantage in this regard as well. So I think there are a number of factors that do suggest that uh, at, at the moment the policy settings also are making a contribution to uh, this performance. Thank you. There was a question in the back. Yeah. Please. Um, I'm having a hard time trying to interpret this to a, a general audience about um, um, trying to make them understand why what which country is higher than the other and um, just just to make a, a, a an actual example if you could tell me a little bit about Japan now Japan is ranked the highest in the innovation quality but it's 16th could you tell us um, 
a little bit about Japan, why it's 16th, whereas it has the most highest um, innovation quality. The question is about policy. The, uh, uh, indeed, Japan is, is uh, an interesting uh, example um, with a high ranking, that is 16 is, is a high ranking. Um, and um, indeed, it's one of the, the countries in which the, we have uh, relatively slight discrepancies compared to other countries between the input side and the output side. That is, on both sides, uh, we have uh, uh, typically uh, rankings which uh, are never uh, above uh, 35 or 36. Um, this is also an indication of a mature economy where the input side and the output side have been developed with uh, equal degrees of attention. Um, yet, uh, Japan remains a country where uh, further improvements of performance could be achieved um, in the output side. That is, if we look in particular at the uh, creative output, um, there are still areas in which the export of services uh, has not been as high as other exports from, from Japan. This can be explained in different ways. Um, for instance, in the areas of mobile telephony or services related to, to the Internet, the presence of a strong and very active domestic market uh, the, the Docomo syndrome, etc., can explain that uh, operators have been actually satisfied with developing internally, and therefore there was no pressing need to export as we would find in a smaller, smaller economy. This could be uh, an explanation. Uh, but um, uh, clearly, Japan ranks among those countries who have uh, a very long tradition of higher, higher education. Um, and, um, and this translates, of course, in the, the performance of uh, the country's own industry and research, uh, research areas. Um, these are, if we look at the, the traditional sources of uh, competitiveness of, of Japan, uh, they are very much engineer-centric uh, sectors. Uh, whether we look at electronics, whether we look at the automobile industry, etc., uh, these are sectors which are in uh, a deep um, um, phase of recreating themselves. So if we look, for instance, at the automobile industry, uh, looking at new sources of power, uh, self-driven car, etc., is an area in which two main components of innovation will need to be reinforced. One is the, the software part. Okay? So to a large extent, the education system needs to allow uh, the graduates to move away from traditional engineering into more software, software-based areas. The other one, which should not be underestimated, is that if we look at the, the greatest success uh, among companies worldwide, innovation has been less and less technology-based and more and more business model-based. Uh, examples are Uber and, and other companies, uh, and there's a clear chance that all these sectors I mentioned before, whether they have to do with electronics, with the car industry, would be influenced by the change in, in business models. So I expect that when Japan gets up to speed in those areas, it will be also reflected on the output side. Just to follow up, so if, if my understanding is correct, the definition of innovation here is about the level of impact that um, directly connects to the con world economy, if you, in a sense, if there is there like a technology. You see, I, I think this, is, this comes from a question from the Japanese mindset that innovation tends to sound like technology itself, you know? I mean, so you're actually saying that the definition of innovation in your report is more so like driven from the economic standpoint, whereas is, is this certain country a country that is um, highly efficient in innovation to put cap capital in, if you get what I mean? Is it more like in, in a, if, if you see Switzerland and if you see the difference of the United States, um, you would rather 
um, pouring to Switzerland because you would rather get high, I would say, return out of it rather than the United States. So I'm just trying to make this simple. In, in a the, uh, this is, from an economics point of view, this is a fascinating discussion. It probably take us too far. So let me just flag three uh, pointers here, and I'd be very happy to, to pursue the conversation offline. Uh, number one, the definition of innovation we use is the, what we call the Oslo definition, the OECD definition, that looks at innovation from whatever creates something that had not existed before, which can be either fundamental or incremental. Second, the, as mentioned before, um, the GII tries to be a holistic index. So it includes both on the input side in particular, things which, which have absolutely nothing to do with the output. We, we, on that side, we don't look whether it's successful or not. We look how much money is being spent, how many people are employed, what kind of efforts are developed in the area of innovation. And the third pointer is that, uh, indeed, looking at the impact uh, is what we should all be striving for. And this is the most difficult part of any index. And it's not just the impact on the national economy, it's the global impact that it has, which may have return effects on the national economy. We, we are not there yet. And I, I don't think that when we look at the 29th or 39th edition of the report, we will be there yet. But as Francis Gurry mentioned, every year we try to improve on the methodology. And the closer we get to actually estimating impact, the better it will be. But it will be a continuing effort. Any more questions? <coughs> Reuters. Uh, Stephanie Nebehe, Reuters. Could you elaborate a little bit on, um, on China's uh, sort of having entered this um, top 25, uh, what it has to do to sort of stay Stay in that um, category. What uh, what sort of in, in addition to attracting, you know, bright foreign brains, um, what sort of investments does it need to make to maintain that level? Um. Yes, it is um, uh, symbolic that China this year enters the top 25. Uh, every year we keep repeating that um, uh, you know year-to-year -year comparison can be can be delicate, and uh, uh, you know if if next year uh, China is 27, we should not start saying, oh, China is collapsing, innovation is disappearing. Okay, these are very little differences. Um, Breaking into the top 25 is symbolically important. And as I mentioned before, it is probably a harbinger for more of the same to come. And we're going to see uh, a number of spectacular things from China, no doubt. Uh, we're going to see also other emerging countries emulating China and, and proving efficient uh, innovators. Um, there are currently a number of concerns about China. Okay? How much uh, of a slowdown are going to see in, in, uh, in growth. Uh, the IMF just uh, issued a warning about uh, China's debt. Uh, so there's a number of question marks which are typically there in a fast-growing economy of the size of China. So it's not, uh, th there are no surprises. Um, but as uh, has been the, uh, the subject of many debates inside China itself, uh, debate about you know, growth between rural and urban areas, inequalities, the emergence of a middle class, uh, turning to smaller, uh, to bigger uh, family cells in size, all these pose great challenges. Um, and I'm not saying that innovation is the uh, panacea or the universal answer to all of that, but it's clearly part of the mechanism. That is, in many of these areas, China will be facing issues that other countries have been facing in the past, but never with the size uh, of the population of China. So that will require innovative thinking. Uh, and again, uh, as mentioned before, uh, we're not just looking at technological innovation, we're looking at innovation as a mindset. So this performance of China, which is remarkable, uh, is going to translate in other areas as well. Uh, just if I may add uh, one word to uh, what Bruno has said. Uh, 
it's obviously extremely um, difficult to address in a few words such a complex phenomenon as a, as a uh, as an economy in a country the size of China. So that said, uh, I would just emphasize that they are in the middle of a transition which is an extremely ambitious transition. So uh, if you like, the, just to use a banal example, on the back of the iPhone, but I still can't read it even if I've got my glasses on it, uh, on, I think it says, uh, designed in California and designed in California and assembled in China. So the objective is really to reverse that, if you like, to have a much larger input of intellectual resources in the whole process of the production and distribution of uh, uh, economic goods and services. Uh, and that's a very, very complex uh, transition. And it's a very, very complex strategy that is being implemented in China, which is extremely comprehensive. And it covers all of the things that are, that are measured by way of the indicators uh, in this index. And what, the, what those indicators are showing is steady improvement, consistent, steady improvement. Uh, and there's no reason to think that that, you know, will not continue. On the contrary, uh, uh, with the amount of resources that are being invested in research and development, in education, uh, in looking for ways to improve the market performance of, of, uh, of innovation, one would expect that the tendency will continue to be extremely positive uh, and uh, that it will uh, continue to climb on the ladder. I think that would be uh, on the basis of the past or yesterday being the best guide to tomorrow. Uh, that would be what uh, I think we would expect to see. <coughs> Just a footnote to that. There are many, uh, uh, you provoke me, Francis, but the, uh, uh, so I'm going to say something I shouldn't say, but there are many um, uh, cliches about innovation. And one of the uh, most entrenched cliches I've heard for so many years is when a new idea comes up, the Americans turn it into a new business, the Chinese copy it, the Europeans regulate it. Uh, guess which of these three cliches will be destroyed first? Uh, I have my own bets. I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, look, I would add one other thing, if I may. Until 1800, China was preeminent in science and technology. So, uh, in a sense, uh, it is not something new that we are e experiencing. Uh, it is a renaissance rather than a naissance. Uh, so, up until 1800, they were... Uh, they had a preeminent position in science and technology, and many of the inventions that powered the European uh, Renaissance and uh, the European rise came from China, such as, for example, printing, uh, which enabled widespread literacy and, of course, was an extremely important factor in the European Renaissance, or such as the compass, which enabled navigation and which was an extremely important uh, instrument in the European conquest of the world, or such as gunpowder, uh, which also was an extremely important uh, instrument in the European conquest of the world. So um, I, I think we also need to bear the historical context in mind when we talk about China as well. And just another footnote, China also invented bureaucracy, but France perfected it. Uh, there are no more, one more. Zhao from Tsinghua. Um, compared to the first edition of the, this report, maybe nine years ago, so which area, which specific area China achieved the biggest progress? Compared to nine years ago, the first edition, in which area has China achieved the biggest uh, uh, progress? 
The, um, I don't have the time series in front of me, but uh, I'm ready to uh, summarize it in the, in the following way. Uh, we've seen progress in all areas. Of course, a quite spectacular one, but uh, WIPO would know better than I do about it, is the number of patents and licenses issued from, uh, from China. Uh, but if we looked at uh, what I mentioned before, this is the quality of innovation that we see in education, in publications, etc. Uh, progress also have been spectacular. My name is Serge Safron. I write for Nezavisimaya newspaper in Moscow. It's a general newspaper, and my questions, uh, two questions, will be far from being uh, technical. Question number one relates to economic profiles. Yes, statistics, uh, GDP and GDP per capita. In a footnote, is a source of data given uh, reports prospect of population and uh, estimates. Are they uh, really estimates or how reliable and comparable they are? In my second question relates to the future of this report. Its draft, uh, has, has it been discussed within the Secretariat and uh, uh, also within expert groups outside the Secretariat? Will it be discussed uh, by member countries? When? Uh, will member countries have an opportunity, chance uh, to question some conclusions or to make some additions? What is, sorry, I just started in this area. Sure. So uh, let me answer the second one first. So it's a scientific index. Uh, so it's not subject of a, a political process. Uh, it is a scientific index that is prepared with the approval uh, for the process of our member states. Uh, we have been involved in this for a number of years now, uh, and there has never ever been any complaint on the part of the member states. On the contrary, they find it to be an extremely useful tool. Uh, but the scientific element of it will remain uh, predominant, and that is exceptionally important for the credibility uh, and acceptability of the index. Uh, so I think that our member states look with great interest at the index. They use it as a resource, uh, but they don't seek to influence, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the development or um, uh, the findings of the index. Now, as far as the specific questions about uh, two indicators are concerned, maybe Bruno or Sasha could um, uh, make a comment on that. Um, yes, I will let uh, actually Sasha address the uh, GDP and, and population issues because they are uh, very much linked to recognize sources uh, and reflect the methodology. Um, but um, I, I want to echo what um, uh, Francis Gore just said because it's critically important uh, for what this document is about. Uh, I, I like the objective scientific, some others would use academic. Um, the, it boils down to the same. This is an exploration. We try to understand better. We try to explore. The, the document, the report, does not draw conclusions saying this is the way you should do innovation. Okay? There's no recommendation of that kind. It says it seems that those countries who have been more successful in the ways we define success have been doing A, B, C, D. Draw your own conclusions. But we also try to understand what are the mechanics behind and what makes the difference between two countries who apparently follow the same policy and have achieved different results. Uh, so this notion of exploring, questioning, uh, looking at the future as a range of possibilities rather than something uh, predetermined is, is critically important for the philosophy of this, of this document. Um, Sasha, you want to address the uh, GDP uh, and population issues? Yeah, thank you, Bruno. I, I suggest I take this issue up bilaterally with the journalist. Uh, I think the point I want to mention is that um, we then take this index uh, into the discussion within countries after the global launch. And uh, one of the advisory mem board members of the GII is actually from Russia, uh, Leonid Gokberg. And uh, he will host uh, such an event uh, to discuss uh, you know, the different um, strengths and weaknesses of the, of the country in question as well. No. My question relates to Russia or to any other country. Sure, sure. sure. On each sure. country, we have here statistics, GDP, in GDP per capita and population, yeah. yes? And there's a source on page 172, it's indicated that, first of all, 
population prospects is not the last available data, not the problem. And the second is for the economic outlook. It's also not uh, the data that is available. It's nothing to do with reliability or... Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. No. So why, in other words, if I may... No, no, I, uh, yeah. I understand perfectly your question. So, Bruno, yeah. Yes, I, I had not understood your question. Now I understand it. It's about prospects and outlook. Actually, this uh, may be misnomers. These are the choice made by the Population Division of the UN and the IMF. Uh, they call their regular publication outlook and prospects. The data included in those publications are not prospective data. They reflect the past. So it's a I think you, you, you raise an interesting point, which is that the title of the application is not an indicator of what actually the data is. Not only the past, but what year? What year? 2015, 2014, or just even for general orientation? Yes, no, this is an important point, so I can also answer it very quickly. The Our uh, philosophy, our methodology in the report is to provide the latest available data. Latest available data depends on what the uh, institution of origin considered as available. Uh, for instance, if we use uh, IMF data, these are data collected by the IMF, checked with the governments of the relevant countries, and then published. At, at the point where it is published, it is the data we use. That's the background we share. <laughs> yes, please. Hi, Xin from CCTV, the national TV of China. Um, my question is probably not totally related to this ranking, but rather related to the G20 summit that's going to be held in China, because one of the top priorities is about innovation, actually among the four eyes, if anybody heard any um, related information about the this year's G20, it's uh, um, innovation, uh, invigoration, interconnectedness, and inclusiveness. Is, are we talking about the same innovation here? Thank you. Short answer, yes. Um, so what's the significance of this ranking for what G G20 leaders are you know, committed to do, to lift the world sluggish growth into a more stronger footing. Yes. So taking up uh, uh, Bruno's point, um, it is a resource. So uh, the G20 will presumably discuss what sort of policies it might be useful to collaborate on as the G20 in order to advance, in this case, in this eye, innovation. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, we believe, at any rate, an important resource for consideration in the development of that political discussion <coughs> about what policy orientations would be useful uh, for the world. Can innovation really um, live up to the expectation of world leaders? Well, I think, uh, yes, uh, innovation can, personally I would say, innovation can live up to the expectation, but whether the uh, right policy mix and implementation is going to achieve the sort of innovation that will actually uh, deliver the results is a different question. So innovation can do it, then it's up to countries to see if they can get their policy uh, settings and, uh, uh, and their ecosystem into a position in which they will deliver on the promise of innovation.